So in Louisiana, we have gambling addicts and we have revenue addicts. Selected officials are being funded by the lobbying industry, the gambling industry. That's the biggest advantage that I think that we have. We'll never have as much money, but the thing that we have that they will never have is the truth. For them, what matters is that their attorney told them that if they do anything that opposed the casino whatsoever, they would be sued for $60 million, and they immediately folded. It didn't matter that 90% of their constituents were opposed to it. One lawyer's voice carried more weight than that. So you want to find ways to get lawyers involved in the process. So mental health first aid kits. And with every mental health first aid kit, you get information about gambling in our state. decided to do a little bit about just the brief history of gambling in Louisiana. I think some of you might find that kind of interesting and, well, interesting. And believe it or not, Louisiana law defines gambling as the intentional conducting or directing or assisting in the conducting of a game of contest, a game contest, lottery, or a contrivance whereby a person risks the loss of anything in value in order to realize a profit. And whoever commits that crime shall be fined, and whoever uh, directs that and supervises or conducts illegal gambling would possibly receive a fine of $20,000 or prison imprisonment by hard labor. So, like, what's up with that? So gambling is illegal in Louisiana, right? Well, if you read this, you'd think that any of the current forms of gambling, like sports betting, casinos, riverboats, slot machines, all of those things would be illegal. Well, Louisiana politicians found a way to get around that by automatically fixing that by changing the word gambling to gaming and by saying that gaming is not illegal according to Louisiana law. So therefore, all of those things are not illegal. So they changed the language, changed the law. So they fixed that for themselves. So in the old days, uh, before I was born actually, I think, uh, local sheriffs would go around with axes busting up one-armed bandits in gaming parlors around our state. But things began to change in the 90s when Louisiana plunged headlong into legalized gambling and authorizing more gambling than any other state at the time. And leading the charge was someone you may have heard of, Governor Edwin Edwards, and some of you may have uh, heard that name before. There's an excellent book called Bad Bad on the Bayou by a man named Tyler Bridges. And if you want to read about the machinations of corruption and how gambling became entrenched in Louisiana, you should read that book. I mean, it's probably it's stories that you could replicate in other states. And I always say, if I had read that book before I got involved in the gambling fight, I probably would have felt like it's a waste of time. Like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get anywhere. So from 1990 to 1992, we legalized almost every form of gambling. Of course, not sports betting, because that was still not allowed. And uh, the, in 1992, Louisiana approved a land-based casino at the foot of Canal Street. If you've ever been to New Orleans, you might have seen that. Um, and uh, what that vote, uh, there was a vote taken on the casino. The Speaker of the House at the time, his name was John Alario, uh, he shut down the machines early, so the, the voting machines, so that the opponents of the casino could not vote on it. And according to the book, Bad Bad on the Bayou, uh, John Alario was handing out lobbyist checks to the legislators on the House floor uh, while the vote was going on. At that time, the governor promised that the casinos were going to provide millions and billions of dollars and all sorts of, uh, all sorts of jobs for people in the New Orleans area, which is desperate for jobs and to, and to employ people. But year after year, the casino, the land base, the one land based casino failed to perform and has come back to the legislature every year or so to ask to have their obligations reduced. And of course, the legislature dutifully uh, provided that. So, in the end, the governor of our state, Edwin Edwards, uh, 
He went from pinstripes to jail stripes. He ended up in jail because of his activities in the process of legalizing gambling. And just recently, a state senator who was a member of the Senate committee, which has oversight of the, um, of the uh, gambling industry in Louisiana, she went to jail for using her campaign funds and state party funds, of which she was the chair, for gambling. And so uh, she is now in prison. We have a combination of Indian gam gambling, state-sponsored lottery, big corporations operating riverboats and casinos. We have horse racing. And then we have, the, uh, we have truck stop casinos, which have video poker. And then every mom and pop bar and restaurant can have up to three video poker machines in their uh, establishment. One thing is, uh, when this was going on when in the 90s, when this was taking place, I was a young mother, and I, already, I was already active at the Capitol on other issues, but for some reason, I didn't feel like this was a big threat, or maybe I felt that this is a fight we can't win. And so I didn't really get involved, and I really regret that. At least, it might have been inevitable, but I still wish that I had been involved in that. And um, I've spent the last 23 years trying to, to, to uh, prevent the expansion and deregulation of gaming and gambling. And um, of course, that's a very difficult task. And in the meantime, I did become part of the Louisiana Family Forum, which was, um, has greatly allowed me to expand my effectiveness statewide and, and on that and other issues. Gambling has surpassed the oil and gas industry in Louisiana as our top industry, and um, it's, it's also provided uh, a tool uh, uh, by sharing some of the revenue with the local governments. It provided a tool that would encourage more people to want to have gambling in our state. The same guy, John Olario, at some point recently said it would take a crowbar to get rid of gambling now. It would take a crowbar to get rid of gambling now. Kind of interesting is that um, uh, John Allaire, uh, Evan Edwin Edwards has passed away now, but when he was governor, he had married a younger woman. And now, um, after he passed away, John Alario is engaged <laughs> to the younger lady that uh, was married to Edwin Edwards. Kind of uh, interesting. So in Louisiana, we have gambling addicts and we have revenue addicts. And the local, the state government and the local governments are addicted to gambling revenue as well. And uh, they said, like we talked about last night, there was a great presentation about education dollars and how they dedicate money to education, but it never really seems to work out. And they're always constantly still trying to drum up more money for education because what they did was when the gambling revenue came in, they used the money that they were paying for education for other things. So funds are fungible, as they say. We talk of so-called sin taxes, and I just wanted to briefly mention that. Um, that's taxes that are levied on certain behaviors that supposedly are, are the state is trying to discourage and um, those are potentially harmful. And so the tax is supposed to be a disincentive for the products, right, or for the behaviors. And that could be anything, tobacco, alcohol, or gambling. The problem is when the state gets involved in sin, it becomes a partner with the sin. And this becomes a powerful disincentive for, for the state to try to regulate or eliminate the sin, right? I want to mention one thing that's uh, been tremendous, a couple of, just quickly, a couple of victories. Number one is um, a, a few years ago, by, Les had recommended that I do something, which I did, and that was to see, I did a 10-year study of the amount of personal wealth that was lost in the state of Louisiana due to gambling. And it turned out to be like $3 billion a year. We only have 400,000 people in Louisiana, but $3 billion a year are lost to personal wealth. And many of those people who lost that suffered life-changing uh, financial issues. I also used this book by, Dr. by Professor John Kent to determine the amount of problem gamblers and what they were costing our state. And we found that about every year, um, there's about a 2.7 billion loss of, well, pay, that's paid out in social costs and other things 
on addicted gamblers and another 2.5 billion based on problem gamblers. Just two quick things of victories that we've had. One is um, something we passed a bill called we called Johnny's Milk Money, and uh, we required that corporate uh, gambling interest had to check the uh, database of the Department of Children and Family Services and see if any of the people that were winning uh, had, uh, they were delinquent in child support. And um, they found, with that's just in the people who have won, they've recovered millions and millions of dollars through that. So I think that's an amazing thing. Uh, two years ago, um, we uh, there was a move to move a riverboat into a neighborhood, into a marina, in a in a city just north uh, yeah just north of New Orleans, it passed the legislature. But amazingly, the people of that parish rejected that casino. That was a, an awesome thing. So um, I just it's difficult. Louisiana is a very difficult place uh, to work on gambling, and um, we just continue to stand strong against expansion and deregulation. Uh, money is of course a powerful incentive. Uh, John Quincy Adams said, duty is ours, the results are up to God, and so we just continue to try to do our duty and be obedient, and then leave the results up to God. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jeannie Seaver, I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and started Moms Against Gambling. A lot of people ask me why, so I thought I would share a little bit of the story with you. I'm not real good at sitting down and talking, but I'm going to do my best. So please, always got to stand tall. So um, I did run for lieutenant governor uh, in the great state of Georgia. I was the only candidate in the race. Even we had every statewide race up for re-election. I was the only candidate statewide, no matter if you were a state rep, if you were a state senator, no matter governor, lieutenant governor, no one, no one would touch this issue of gambling. So I stood up bold, and it definitely wasn't um, an easy task, as um, you can imagine the, you know, how dare you talk about, you know, making it come infringing on our constitutional rights. It should be our choice, not theirs. But. At the same time, when you learn what I've learned, and if it wasn't for Professor Kent and Les and Stop Predatory Gambling, and you know, and I'm so grateful too today to have just to say that it has been an honor to meet every one of you because I feel so much comf com confident that it's nice to know that we have a network together and there's been bonds made here. And we all know, especially being on the campaign trail, you feel alone sometimes. You feel very alone. So there were many down times when people would personally attack me about how you about the gambling issue, and it's like, and and I and I had to share a story, one and most importantly, because it was like divine intervention, because I wanted to give up many times. I was at a, um, and I get emotional every time I think about this because the Holy Spirit goes through me. When it when you see that. The gambling industry is targeting our children on their iPhones and their iPads and their video games. And I traveled around that state, the state for 18 months. And I was shocked to hear, because I've been advocating against gambling for over six years, how many, res all, how many Georgians were not even aware, one, that the big gambling push was happening at the state capitol. Do you know that Georgia has 84 paid lobbyist every year at our state capitol. We only have 56 senators, for goodness sakes, 84 paid lobbyists. And most of our lobby and most of our elected officials are being funded by the lobbying industry, the gambling industry. So, so I went to this one meeting. There was this young boy, he was 10 years old. First time he had been to a meeting ever, you know, and um, he was listening, I was talking about the gambling issue, and he, he, when I finished, he stood up and he said, Miss Seaver, and I go, yeah, and he goes, I'd like to speak about gambling, I say, I know exactly what you're talking about, 10 years old, 
I constantly get slot machines popping up on my iPhone, my video games, and my iPad, encouraging me to go play the slots, which have Spider-Man. I mean, they target as young as Spider-Man or Sonic, encouraging me to gamble, to go, and, and to get free stuff. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll keep going. I mean, you can't have a 10-year-old child stand up and say that randomly in a meeting full of 100 people. And, you know, it's like he wants you to keep going on. I've had many confrontations, you know, and I'll, and I'll tell you, we have been pushed very hard. There's a lot of organizations we are very grateful for in Georgia that are against gambling. So the one thing that's really sad is that we as citizens have elected our elected officials and felt like they were elected for us to go up there and do what we felt that they thought we thought what was best for us. But that's not the case. Do you know it's catastrophic if our elected officials hear from three of us during a legislative session? So we've entrusted them, so they've got, they do whatever they want. Well, we said that's enough. So we were successful this year on stopping gambling in Georgia. There was a legislation in the House that was proposed. There was two Senate bills in the Senate. Both of them failed. Um, I don't know how many are familiar with crossover day. That means if, if you don't get a certain, there, if you're the 30, the 15th, 16th day of a session, there's 30 days in session, 15 days of session. If you don't make it, your legislation doesn't pass out of the mm -hmm. House or Senate, it goes nowhere. So none of the, the gambling bills got passed. So there was a young lady, I know I'm probably going over my time, but this is really important story I wanted to share with you. And, was there was a young lady, freshman state rep. She um, had this bill called um, Soapbox Derby. She wanted, she was from Lyons, Georgia, and she wanted to make Lyons, Georgia, the Soapbox Derby capital of the state. So she goes over to present to the Senate Committee on Economic and Tourism, and what happens? They take her bill, the, the committee, and they added in 43 pages of sports betting into her soap box mm -hmm. derby bill. That's how desperate, that's how aggressive. And that's, they made her amend it on the floor. They forced her to, I mean, it was it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it was, that freshman was, just, I mean, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, it was just like, it was, anyone, regardless of your political stripes, it was appalling the democratic aspect of it, so. Yeah, and my state senator was the one that seconded to pull her language, because she said, look, I don't want my language to be included in any kind of sports betting bill. You pull my soapbox derby bill, my language out. And my state senator seconded that. And it was just, it was just so disgraceful. And even Senator Dugan, who was a supporter of sports, of gambling, stood up in that committee, he was a member of that committee, and he says, you know what? I can't believe you guys. You just took a soapbox derby bill and put sports betting in it. You just put the sports betting legislation back five years. I cannot support this bill, and I will encourage anyone and everyone to vote against it. I mean, that's how desperate it is, and that's how hard it is. So I think as far as moving forward, you have to be bold. I don't know. I was bold enough to run this, this ad, which basically were my opponents, that were running, and Stacey Ever Abrams, all running on the gambling issue as lieutenant governor. And of course, um, that, that, that you can imagine how many enemies I made by putting something like that out. But you know what? It's always about the right thing to do, and people have to protect our children. So the most important thing when, you, when we organized an, um, a group of folks, you got to have, they got to have some kind of ammo. So we created this, these bullet points on, you know, the biggest, the biggest expression that the lobbyists have told the legislators to say is, it's for the kids. If you vote against gambling, you're voting against children's kids. Do you know how much of that Hope Scholarship is what our education, 23% of the funds we raise 
for Hope Scholarship through the lottery, because we have lottery and the COAM machines, 23% goes to Hope Scholarship. The rest goes, some for payouts, but who knows? The kids are not getting the education that we need. But anyway, um, I'm getting that. <laughs> but I think it's really, really important you have, you know, if it wasn't for all of y'all, and especially John, I would have never been able to move forward, but I'm gonna move forward and educate Georgians on the importance of what the gambling industry does to us. And tell me one more thing, $10 billion in surplus Georgia had in the last two years. And they say they need that money. We need to pass gambling because they need the money for the kids at Hope. It's, it's a bunch of baloney. Um, it's not an easy task, but I tell you what, I'm, the Lord is with me every moment, and I am very grateful to be here and to share my story, and I will keep the message and keep educating Georgians and the state nationally. Gambling is not something that we, our children, need in our future. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning again. My name is Nate Graz, and I'm the policy director for the Nebraska Family Alliance and serve on the board of Gambling with the Good Life, which has been led by our salt shaker, Pat Winter, for many <laughs> years. Um, and I want to really start by thanking Les and everyone at Stop Predatory Gambling. Uh, I know for myself, uh, every time I get to hear Les speak, I just have a renewed uh, energy to, to be in this fight, and it's great to get to learn from you all as well. So. Uh, this morning, I'm going to share just uh, a little bit about what it's like fighting the gambling industry at the state capitol, um, some of the challenges that we face, and hopefully how you can be effective in opposing uh, expanded gambling uh, in the gambling industry at, at your state capitol. Uh, so in my work, I get to work on a variety of different issues, uh, but without question, the gambling industry specifically is as persistent as any. Uh, they are relentless. They are back year after year, constantly trying to take new ground inch by inch. Uh, they are well-funded, which is not a surprise to anyone here, uh, but they're also usually very well organized. And I know that uh, every state is, is different and has their own unique uh, political realities and circumstances, but I think there are a few things that, uh, sort of uh, general principles that uh, apply across the board. And so first I would really say that the single most effective tool at your disposal in doing policy work and lobbying is relationships. Mm -hmm. And that might sound kind of obvious, but you, you really cannot underestimate the value of personal relationships and the difference that that can make. Uh, because you might have all the facts on your side, you might know this issue backwards and forwards, but if you don't have that relationship, then too often what you're saying just falls on deaf ears. Uh, for example, my very first year lobbying, I was talking to you a senator about a fantasy sports gambling bill. I was walking him through the arguments. He was nodding his head, agreeing with everything I was saying. He even told me a tragic story of someone he knew who lost everything gambling. And then in the very next breath, he said, but I have to vote for it because I already promised someone that I would. So you, you really cannot replicate the type of influence that comes from personal relationships. So this requires a certain level of consistency and it's an investment of your time, but it's one of the most important things that you can do. And you want to do this work and start building those relationships early. So we're meeting with legislators, not only before our session begins, but with candidates before they're even elected, so that if and when they get down to our state capitol, they already know who we are, and we've built that relationship and that trust, and that can really pay dividends down the road. Uh, so secondly, uh, to effectively oppose the gambling industry at the state level, you really need a strong coalition, and you want that coalition uh, to be as big as possible. The unique opportunity that, that we have here is that this is one of the few issues that truly can transcend politics, uh, because at its core, this is a justice issue. This is not just an issue of personal vice. Uh, this is a justice issue that defines how it is that we love our neighbors and uphold the common good. And so that's a real opportunity. Um, so we're to get multiple people from different organizations and backgrounds to reach out to legislators. Uh, and again, do that work early before they even have a chance to vote on a bill. Because here's the thing, uh, there is no grassroots movement for expanded gambling. That's something that Les talked about yesterday. When we testify against the gambling bills at our state capitol, and this is real, literally, the only people who show up to speak in support of the gambling bills are the people who are paid to be there. Our hearings are open to the public, anyone can come, 
And every time, every bill, it's just the registered lobbyists who are paid to be there. And that's it. So when you can get even just a handful of constituents, you know, real people just taking time out of their day to come down and tell their legislator, this is not something that we want for our community. That can really make a difference and really help elevate this issue in the minds of our legislators. So the third thing I would emphasize uh, is the value of personal stories. You need personal stories. Um, and of course, we, we obviously we need facts and good data too, that, that is critical. Um, but you need personal stories because facts alone don't persuade people at an emotional level. And as difficult as it is to remember, politicians are people too. Um, we are emotional beings and incorporating human interest stories, uh, it just engages not only legislators, but uh, members of the press and the broader public in ways that, that numbers and data uh, just, just don't. And I also think that this is somewhere where we can win, right? Because what human interest stories does the gambling industry have? They can't talk about how this has helped ordinary citizens. They can't talk about how their bill to expand gambling is, is gonna you know, transform someone's life for the better. So work with individuals who can speak from that lived experience whenever you can, uh, because that just changes the entire conversation. You're no longer just talking about numbers, you're talking about people. And politics matters because policies matter, because people matter. So build relationships and do your work early, get a strong coalition and share personal stories. I think we really need all of these things because while they don't have the grassroots, the gaming industry does have a uh, seemingly endless amount of resources at their disposal. Um, but I would say also, you know, I think really one of the biggest challenges we face, uh, it's not just one of financial disparity, uh, but of apathy. You know, what I like to remind people is that what happens at your state capitol doesn't stay at your state capitol. The decisions made by our representatives impact the lives of real people. And we need to find ways to keep amplifying our message and raising the level of attention that this issue receives. Because whether someone gambles or not, this issue is going to impact them, but most people don't realize that until it's too late. So I think what's happening here this week is incredibly important. You know, we need to care as much about the victims of predatory gambling as the gambling industry cares about increasing their bottom line. And we need to be as effective at speaking the truth as they are about hiding it. And lastly, I'll say that's the biggest advantage that I think that we have. We will never have as much money, but the thing that we have that they will never have is the truth, right? The house always wins. So when your state expands gambling, in order for the state to win, it's your own citizens who have to lose. That's the truth, and that's true in my state, and it's true in your state, because that's how gambling is designed to work. But politics, especially state and local politics, is won by the people who show up. So we have to show up and show up consistently to keep speaking the truth, because when the state partners with the gambling industry, they then uh, are, are motivated to help conceal the truth from the public. And that's why the worst form of censorship, even worse than government censorship, is self-censorship. When we choose to silence ourselves on the issues that really matter. So keep showing up, keep speaking the truth, and let's remind people not just what we're against, but what we're for. We're against gambling because we're for families, we're for kids, we're for real opportunity, and we're, we're for lifting people up rather than holding them down. And I think that's a winning message, and it's a message that more people need to hear. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Schaefer. I'm from State College of Pennsylvania, which is the home of Penn State University. Uh, I'm going to be standing over here because Les is pulling up a resource that I'd like to share with you on the screen, and I don't want to be blinded by the projector. Um, but Les has asked me to share some information about what I've learned over the last two years fighting against the development of the casino. Uh, it's intended to be built three miles from Penn State's main campus, where we have 48,000 undergraduate students being championed by current and former trustees at the university itself. Uh, and it's really hard to sum up two years of experience in eight minutes, but I'll try. The first thing, uh, and it was mentioned yesterday, is really important is to do your research. Find all the places that you can inject your, your uh, advocacy into the process of the casino being approved. Find ways to slow it down or to stop it completely. It's going to differ from state to state, even from community to community, but you need to know what you actually are supposed to be targeting. Just getting people riled up about it is not going to have any effect. You need to know where are the effective levers of power that you can influence the situation and actually make a difference. Um, along with that, in our experience, it has been crucial to get lawyers involved. 
have, our community does not have any lawyers involved. We have 90% public opposition to the casino. Uh, we've lobbied our public officials. We've gotten nowhere. What has gotten somewhere is that there's another casino developer who is suing our gaming control board in Pennsylvania, saying that they broke their own rules in the way that they've gone about the process of licensing this casino. That has held this up for years, and it looks like it's going to be another two years delayed before that happens. We're hopeful that the court case will be favorable to us, that they're going to have to go back to the starting point. At that point, our community will be ready and mobilized that if they try this again, we're going to be there at the initial public hearings, uh, and we will have overwhelming opposition to it at that level. Still no guarantee that the Gaming Control Board will listen to us, but it will be obvious that they're going against the public will at that point if they do. Uh, in order to get that public opposition, the way that we've done that is we've set up a lot of online resources. We set up a website. This is the website right here. It's grown a lot over the last two years. Um, we've set up a Facebook group. It's linked to right there at the top. We've set up an email list so we can get in direct contact with people and mobilize our community to very rapidly do things. We've cultivated relationships with the media uh, by staging displays. Uh, we haven't had organized protests in our particular campaign, but other campaigns have done that. You can get media attention with something like that. We went out in front of the university campus and we took all the public feedback that had been submitted to the Gaming Control Board several months into our campaign. Uh, it was 10 to 1 against, and so we put all the feedback opposing on white poster boards. We had 10 or 11 of those. We had all the feedback in support, which was part of one white poster board, and we put that up next to it. It was a very striking visual display of how overwhelming the opposition to the casino really was. That got on the evening news in several locations, attracted a lot more attention to our cause. We were able to get those people engaged and involved. All of the resources that we're setting up reference each other. So we always want to be referencing the website, our social media group. We set up an online petition as well. People can sign, say we don't want the casino, they can make a comment against it. We captured all those, sent them into the gaming control board. On that resources, we point them to our website, the Facebook group as well. It's all self-referrals where we want to get people engaged in as many places as we can. So they become invested in the campaign, they make connections there, it becomes something that they take on as their own personal ownership <clears throat> and not just something that they're gonna sign their name and be done with it. Uh, in doing this, we were able to get over 1% of our town engaged in the campaign. Uh, we conducted events where we would go to the College Township Council for three consecutive meetings. We presented to them for over an hour. We had dozens of people speaking at each meeting. Across all of the meetings, everybody spoke against the casino. Only one person spoke in favor. We have reason to believe that they may be acting on behalf of the gambling industry, not out of their own personal conviction. Uh, they worked at a casino. They were saying that that got them out of a, a difficult situation. And I think other people at the university should have the opportunity to work in a casino as well. Uh, but the other 60 or so people who spoke had very strong persuasive arguments across the board why the casino is a bad thing, why it should be obvious that you don't want to be putting a casino right next to 48,000 people in the age 18 to 22 range. Um, but again, with all that public opposition, it, the, the college township counselors said that they agreed with us, they don't want a casino there, but they feel they have no choice. For them, what matters is that their attorney told them that if they do anything that opposed the casino whatsoever, they would be sued for $60 million, and they immediately folded. Uh, it didn't matter that 90% of their constituents were opposed to it. One lawyer's voice carried more weight than that. So you want to find ways to get lawyers involved in the process either to slow it down or to turn the tables decisively like that. Um, the, the casinos come into communities like ours and they have a, a strategy where they act very fast. We talked about that yesterday. They want to get approvals before anybody knows that it's happening. Most of the people in my community didn't even know that there was going to be a proposal for a casino until at least the day after the public hearing had taken place. There was only one public hearing in the process in our community where we have an opportunity to speak. And so if you missed that, and they took great care to make sure that it was scheduled during the week between the summer and fall semesters at Penn State when all the faculty and staff are out of town, when all the students are out of town. There was a pre-registration requirement so that if you wanted to speak at that meeting, you had to register in advance if you showed up and you hadn't done that, you wouldn't be allowed to speak. There were six people who spoke in favor and two people who spoke against. They then took that and said the community overwhelmingly supports the casino by a margin of three to one out of a sample size of eight. Uh, in a community of over 100,000 people. So there's obviously spin going on there, uh, and it's deceptive, which is a, another common theme that we're seeing here. But in order to combat this, 
we, we've been fighting tooth and nail ever since then. We've mobilized an enormous amount of opposition. If you scroll down a little bit on the screen here, you can see the cumulative feedback over time. Uh, what we found is as we got more and more people involved, it, this grew over time. We started writing letters to the editor. We started recruiting people. We went door to door. Uh, again, all of this, we're trying to connect with all of our resources. You can see the disparity in feedback opposing versus supporting grows over time. When you include all the signatures we got in the petitions, it grows exponentially. Uh, by the end of it, we were having an opposition ratio, I think it was 42 to 1 against, which is decisive. And the Game Control Board recognized that. And so they said, we're setting a public feedback deadline on, I think it was June 12th last year. They didn't make a decision about the license until January 25th of this year, but they didn't want to allow us to get enough feedback on record that it would be an obvious public scandal, like when they tried to build a casino next to the Gettysburg Battlefield. Uh, <laughs> they, they got 60,000 people from all over the country saying, you people are crazy, why would you desecrate the Battlefield Memorial by building a casino right there? And we were on track to replicate that, so they cut off our opportunity to do it. Um, when they actually reported their results, they actually characterized the arguments that we put forward pretty well, but the petition results that we had, they said we sent over 7,000 signatures in our petition opposing. We actually only had 3,300, uh, but it seems that they didn't look very closely at the, the cover letters that were submitted explaining that we, said we submitted the first petition, uh, and then a month later we submitted an update to the petition that had all the same signatures, and we did that for the purpose of making it very easy for them. All these signatures went in with the names, contact information, so that they could contact anybody who had signed this and verify that yes, this person really does oppose the casino and they can explain why if they want to, because we knew that the gambling industry would likely challenge us on this and say, well, these aren't real people, they didn't really sign this. Uh, we provided all that, we provided explanations of it, and we didn't want there to be any confusion in terms of who actually signed it. So at the end, we sent them a complete finalized list in addition to the interim list that we had sent before, and said, just look at the final list, we even went through and we deduplicated the names because we have an online petition, a hard copy petition. We want to be absolutely fair about this and say, if somebody signed both, we're going to flag their name <coughs> so that we're giving you an actual account of distinct individuals here. Well, they didn't read any of that. They didn't look at any of it. They just said 7,000 plus people signed the petition. Well, there's 10,000 people in the municipality where the casino is being built. So the Gaming Control Board is saying, even if over 70% of the people in the municipality said, we didn't want this, we're going to do it anyway. That's um, true. And so that, that's why you need lawyers, and you need to get the lawyers involved early. But you, you need to get opposition started early, too. If we were truly to have overcome this, they, the Gaming Control Board had a 30-day window between when they said we're going to end the feedback period when it actually ended. So in reality, in our situation, we would have 30 days to get everything that we need to defeat the casino. We had to stand it up very rapidly. Our campaign took a long time because when I got involved in it, I wasn't expecting to get involved in this fight long term. I thought I'd write a letter to the editor. Uh, the, the leaders in our town will see reason because they don't want to destroy Penn State and they will act to stop this. Well, that, that's not what happened. Uh, the leaders at Penn State are invested in the casino coming in because current and former trustees are the, the people who own the casino. Um, and they have a great amount of influence over the university and mm -hmm. are using it for their own advantage. We want to help people stand up campaigns in other communities where this happens much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so all the resources that we have, and Les, if you could scroll down so that they can see that as I'm talking, yeah. we've accumulated this on the saynocasino.org website, which is right here. I, this is available for everybody. Please make use of it. Uh, we have history about our own campaign here at the top and references to all the public feedback that's provided there, but the important stuff is down here at the bottom. Uh, we have all the arguments that we've used against the casino in our community, which are generally applicable to any casino in any community, uh, because the principles and dynamics are the same. The casino industry operates the same way, just about everywhere that it goes. Uh, but then we have categorical refutations of each of the arguments in favor of the casinos. We have identification of all the different types of crime and societal harm, they're, they're grouped together in categories here. These are all recent media publications, academic articles, research. You can use this to support your own arguments. You don't have to go out there and spend hundreds of hours finding these things like what our community did. It's all right here. Um, and so please make use of those resources in the future. Make use of what we have learned so that you can stand up a community right away. Perhaps one of the most uh, useful things that we're adding is still active. All of this is actively under development, but 
we're now adding lists of allies. We have groups that oppose predatory gambling specifically. We have groups that oppose all gambling who are going to be natural allies on this issue of expansion of gambling. Uh, we will be soon adding lists of individual casino opposition campaigns across the country. And the idea here is that you can find allies in your own community, you can find them at the national level. Uh, and we can counteract what the gambling industry is doing. The gambling industry comes in, they can divide and conquer. They come into College Township. We have 100,000 people, most of whom are not educated on this issue. We don't have any infrastructure set up. They set up so that, according to their plan, they've got 30 or 60 days to get everything done. Uh, they're going to come in with threats of lawsuits. It's just absolutely overwhelming force. And we're starting at square one. Uh, we don't have any help. It wasn't until after the public feedback was, period was closed that I got connected with Les. Uh, but if we can get people connected, if we can draw resources from across the nation, from across the world to help equip people, and also to coordinate our feedback campaigns, there's nothing that says that you people from around the rest of the country can't write to the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board and explain why this is a bad idea to them. They're going to listen to everybody's feedback. If everybody across the country did that for each one of these campaigns, we could have 50,000 letters opposing each casino. And it would be a very different dynamic in those authorizing authorities in terms of what decision are they going to make if every time that they do this, they're facing Gettysburg level opposition. If we network with each other and do that, I think we can make change there. We saw I think I cut you. I need to cut you there. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, if we agree that if we could recruit 250 software developers across the country, we're going to do some serious damage. Like Andrew Schaefer, what, what they've done in, in State College, Pennsylvania, is incredible. So, amazing work. Great job. Great job. So, I, I know I had my turn yesterday, so I'm not going to take very long. I just want to say that, you know, sitting up here with this group of people, again, it is a, a group effort. It is something that we all need to be in together and to support each other and encourage each other however we can um, in, this, in this effort. I've done different things through grassroots ways before, like Problem Gamblers Awareness Day, my brother's birthday every year in Oregon is Problem Gamblers Awareness Day, signed proclamation by the governor. It's something that I submit every year. Um, we have our Take a Break campaign, our day of action that we do that um, mobilizes lots of different people for different things. We've done prayer groups, we've done sit-ins, we've done um, rallies at the Capitol building, we've set up meetings with legislators. Um, those are things that we can do, like the national smoke out, right, with tobacco. You take a day off, you take that break and take a step back. That's what I'm asking people to do for gambling. Um, because when, we, when people who struggle with a gambling addiction can take a moment, pause for themselves and start conversations with family members, or people in their community, it helps them to know that they're not alone. It again puts that pressure on um, the machines and not on the gambler themselves. They can recognize this, who they are um, and that they are. this is something that you can beat, you can get through it. Um, setting up different things in the community just to make bring awareness again. We do tabling events wherever I can from holiday markets, Saturday markets, farmers markets, um, senior centers is a great place there they you know as we all know they go to the senior centers and bus people to the casinos um, they need this information and they don't have it so getting into to, to, to different places like that I think is super important um, hitting the outlying areas we have um, are a couple of big towns that we live in right there but there's a lot of outlying areas um, where the they don't have that outreach that we do in the bigger city. So hitting those little little spots, I think, are very important in what we do. Um, right now, we're doing uh, mental health first aid kits. And with every mental health first aid kit, you get information about gambling in our state. Um, it gives people that opportunity to start that conversation again and to get out there and recognize that um, the, the struggles that are happening are dealing with suicide and mental health as well. Um, this is a bigger issue, and when we can get people talking about those, then it's an easier conversation to start about the gambling and how um, predatory it is and how we can get that started. So it's harder to get people involved in a conversation about problem gambling when, that, when you lead with that, but I found by 
opening it up to other things, it makes people willing to listen. Um, so. Great. Um, our next speaker is going to be Natasha Schell. And we, have, we have her starting at right at 9.15. So I just, out of respect, we'll, 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 this is the only panel we probably won't take questions, but I thought you really covered the ground. You, you're, we're going to have a longer break in the middle here after Natasha speaks. So we'll have a chance if any questions you want to have with, with our speakers. But it was a great panel. You know, there's a lot of like, diverse political talent on the ground in this country from the, on the right and the left who work together. And I just thought you saw a, a pretty good pretty good sample of some of the kind of different players that are involved with this. So thank you all very much.